Personal Defense Network Live, PDN Live, is the monthly show where I get to interact with you, PDN members and viewers and random internet audience in regard to some topic or maybe it's just Ask Rob Anything. This is the uh, live, free, interactive version of Personal Defense Network. So every month I get to talk about either what I want to or what you want to. Um, I've got my uh, trusty cell phone here. Sam is going to be our moderator tonight. She'll be updating me and hitting me with some questions on the topic of home safety and home security. But before we get started, uh, I'm going to talk about Personal Defense Network. Before I do that, we're going to talk about Springfield Armory, and uh, my good friend Rob Latham is going to talk to you about the XDS Mod 2. I carry a 4-inch XDS. The Mod 2 is the evolution of this model, uh, but it's not available in the 4-inch yet, so I'm sticking with the old model. Um, the XDS is actually how I got to uh, Springfield, how I became uh, kind of associated with Springfield was this 4-inch XDS 9mm single stack uh, came out. I fell kind of in love with it, easy to carry. Uh, very uh, capable as far as personal defense situations go. And uh, this is uh, my buddy Rob Latham talking about the XDS Mod 2. Hi, I'm Rob Latham with Springfield Armory and I'd like to show you the latest variation of our new XDS line of handguns. Very popular and made in calibers 9 and 40 and 45. We've now upgraded it to add quite a few new features. Part of it is the grip frame structure here. We've actually changed the shaping and added a different kind of surface stippling, shall we say, to allow a more comfortable ergonomic grip and also allow it to not slip in your hand while still being easy to carry and not abrade your clothing. We've upgraded a few other things. It has a new set of sights. There's two variations. One has a fiber optic front with a white outline or a white dot rear sight. And the one I'm showing you here has a, a tritium front sight with a black rear sight for kind of that night, night sight set. It comes shipped with two magazines. You get a flush fit. This one is in 45. Other caliber is probably going to follow soon, but the first variation is a 45. Comes with a flush fit, five round magazine, and a plus one six round magazine. I'll put it in here and let you see what it looks like, right? To add just a little bit of length. Now, with our grip sleeve technology, it actually allows you to have a one round in the gun increase in capacity and increase the size of the grip just slightly enough that all your fingers are on the gun. The cost of tiny guns is that they're harder to hold basically. Easier to carry, harder to hold. Now the small gun is very very easy to control and the XDS's have gained quite a following in the marketplace because of how easy they are to carry and on top easy to shoot. I have variations of these guns that I've had since they first came out, and I can tell you I've never fired anything that's as small and compact that's as accurate and easy to control. If you want more information, please go to Springfield-Armory.com. Boom! So there you go. Uh, that was actually the 45 version that first came out with uh, Springfield in that Mod 2, and then uh, I carry, as I said, the 9mm version, the 4-inch version of the XDS. So all of that uh, same stuff is true about the 9mm version except it holds more rounds and they are smaller rounds. Rob and I will debate uh, 9mm or 45. I don't really think he feels undergunned if he's carrying a, a 9mm but he's a big fan of the 45 for personal offense. We here at Personal Offense Network are more a fan of the 9mm as it does meet the minimum requirements with the right kinds of bullets for the vast majority of personal defense situations and you get more rounds Lighter recoil, all those other things. Cheaper practice ammo too. And we do encourage you to practice. Personal Events Network, if you're not familiar with Personal Events Network, we've been around for a long time. We have uh, obviously free information like this. There are, uh, I don't know, over a thousand pieces of content at personaldefensenetwork.com. A uh, large number of them are available for free to anybody who's interested. And then we have behind the paywall for our premium members, we have some other content that is. Uh, Sometimes it's more advanced, sometimes it's more specialized, sometimes it's just stuff we decide to put behind the paywall. We've also got some uh, sponsored information at Personal, Personal Events Network from our advertisers, from our supporters like Springfield Armory and some of the people that support me and the other instructors on the Personal Events Network training tour every year. We also have some of that information on there. And we have the gold level of membership, which offers even more, including discounts with our online distance education classes through the Personal Defense. Academy, which is online full distance education courses. My counter ambush courses are now available there. Caleb Causey has a medical course there. We've got some active shooter response, dealing with law enforcement while armed, a whole bunch of stuff. Alessandro Padovane is on there with a knife class. 
got some new classes getting ready to be launched there at Personal Events Network as an online distance education program, PDN Academy. We actually haven't updated that in a while, so I'm excited about putting another class or two out before the end of the year. And we have just announced to our gold members the opportunity to jump into our platinum level, which you're going to be learning more about if you pay attention to your free newsletters and all the other information that comes out at personaleventsnetwork.com. As I always say with personaleventsnetwork.com, go there, there's going to be a little pop-up window that shows up. When that shows up, just hit the X, close it, use the search bar, go to the, maybe the new videos section, um, take a look at what's, uh, you know, view all self-defense videos. Well, we can see some World's Collide stuff. There's me and Rob Latham talking. Uh, get in there and actually see what's going on. And, uh, you know, spend two or three days a week there. Uh, if you're still there two or three weeks later, obviously you're finding value. Go ahead and sign up for our free newsletter and consider becoming a premium member behind one of our paywalls to get even more benefit from Personal Defense Network. But tonight, um, we'll end the commercials, at least for now. I might do some more commercially stuff later. We are going to get into our question and answers. And boom, we already had a couple of things uh, coming in live, which is great. Uh, I just wanted to kind of check in here and make sure all the audio is working and everything else. You know, the uh, remote studio that I have set up here at the Western Headquarters in Colorado gives me the opportunity to sort of interact with the screen, interact with a couple of different things, and maybe show you some things that I wouldn't normally be able to do. Uh, if you've watched Personal Events Network live for the years that we've been around, you know, sometimes it's uh, live from the studio at our headquarters in uh, outside of Minneapolis. Sometimes it is like me on a cell phone sitting on the side of the road in the tour truck uh, in the middle of nowhere with sketchy uh, coverage and bad audio. So I'm really excited about being able to bring you guys um, a little bit more interactive, a little bit more polished uh, format for Personal Events Network uh, live this week. When we're talking about home security and home safety, make sure that gets where it's supposed to be. Talking about home security and home safety, one of the things that's really important to understand is that that doesn't necessarily get tied to the firearm all the time. And in fact, if you're doing what you're supposed to do in terms of home security, you make it significantly less likely that you're going to need to use a firearm to defend yourself or your family. Of course, that's very important. If we can get rid of the uh, opportunity for someone to physically threaten us through our, our physical security means, through uh, dissuading someone from thinking that we're going to be a target, thinking that we're going to be vulnerable inside of our home, thinking our home would make a, you know, a good place for them to try to do harm to someone or do a, commit a crime, then uh, we win that battle without even really fighting it. You know, a little investment in time, effort, and energy. That's some of the things I want to talk about around home security. On the home safety side, you know, that's where we start talking about firearms owner responsibilities. Um, if we have guns in the house, how are we going to make them uh, less likely to be involved in any kind of an accident, any kind of negligent use, any unauthorized use, or of course theft, right? That's part of that security. It's kind of where safety and security overlap. If your guns are secure, then it's less likely that someone's going to get to them and do something uh, to threaten your safety, whether it's through negligence uh, or through a misunderstanding or et cetera, et cetera. The other way that we make ourselves safer in a home with guns is through our, our training, our capabilities, uh, the maintenance of the gun to a certain extent, and certainly in our tactics, in our plan for armed home defense. Um, if you want to learn more about that, uh, we'll go to the next screen here. You can check out uh, my book, Defend Yourself. So this book has um, been out there for a while. Um, it's still available on Amazon. I think it's on sales at $12.99. You can pick that up. You can get it used for $2.32. I think I see exactly $0 from that. But pick up a used copy or get yourself a new copy. Um, there's also uh, the Kindle version is available, and we also have um, the audiobook, uh, which I did with Clint Macro of Trigger Pressers Union. His uh, real job, while he's one of the busiest instructors I know, is uh, he's an audio guy. So he helps people produce uh, records and audio soundtracks and audio books. So you can learn more details about armed home defense and all of the sort of holistic, comprehensive approach to home defense when there are firearms in the house through that book. Um, but you're going to get a lot of that tonight out of this first hour. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go right to the questions and we're going to take a look and see uh, some of the stuff that was submitted. So this one's from uh, Jim. What can I do to secure my home's front door from intruders? All right, so I'm just going to kind of do this with all the doors. So any exterior door, there's a couple things that you want to look for. First of all, you should have a deadbolt on it. Uh, you want to make sure that you have a deadbolt. The deadbolt not only makes the door more secure than just that little uh, throw that has the angle on it, that when you close the door it sort of automatically goes. You want the deadbolt, which can be locked and actually goes into the door jam through what they call a strike plate. You want to make sure that you have the deadbolt. Not only is the deadbolt security physically, but it also sends a message to anybody looking at your home. We're going to talk a lot about this as we talk about our home security. 
it sends a message to anybody looking at the home that, okay, this person is trying, right? They're taking security seriously. And that's the first level of uh, crime prevention through environmental design or crime prevention just through the message that you send about the environment in and around your home to people who are looking at it as a potential target. The fact that there are deadbolts on all of your exterior doors, not just the front door, is really important. Now, when we think about that front door, obviously, you know, I don't even think it's, it's code allowed to be anything other than a solid door. Now, whether that's a fiberglass door, a foam-filled class one steel door, a solid wood door, you don't want to have a flimsy, hollow kind of interior class door for your entryways for any of your exterior. That's probably obvious. Um, if you have a door that you know, has like real thin wood panels. Um, for some reason, sometimes you see maybe decorative panels in there that look like they could easily be kicked through. If you have a front door that has a lot of glass, especially any piece of glass that could be broken through and someone could reach through the open glass area now and, and open that dead bolt or, you know, even just take a, I don't know, like a, what would you take, a, an, a, any kind of wire, any kind of stick, kind of reach in there if you had a, a clothes hanger and you know, opened it up kind of like you would try to get the lock, the, the door handle on a door. If you could break that glass and someone could kind of reach in there and try to open a door or turn a deadbolt latch, that's something you don't want. So no glass, solid, um, preferably a fiberglass or a class one steel door, it's a very lightweight, kind of thin skinned steel door with foam in the middle. Uh, you want to make sure that you also don't have glass very close to that door. So if you had a really solid, awesome door, but just like, you know, two or two and a half inches of wood between the door and glass, obviously that's going to be a weak point. Someone could probably push through, whether that's the hinge side or the, the throw side where that deadbolt's going to come into the wall, push through that thin wood or break the glass out and again reach in and manipulate the door lock or open the door from the inside. So you want to make sure that you have solid structure around the door, a solid door, and a deadbolt. Then, getting into the details, probably the next most important thing is making sure that you have long screws and heavy-duty screw, screws, not like lightweight drywall screws, but you know, good three-inch screws, heavy-duty screws that go all the way through those strike plates into the 2 by 4s behind that door frame. So you want to go through the strike plate into the 2 by 4s behind the door frame, and again, that reinforces the idea of why you don't want decorative windows right on either side of any of your entryway doors. You want good, solid structure, the walls of the house, the exterior walls of the house to drive those throws into. And then you want to use the same kind of screws for the hinge side also. So now you've got multiple points of contact between the, the two by fours behind the door frame and the door itself. And that's connected by the screws on the hinge side and connected by the throw of one or more deadbolts and then, of course, your, your normal door latch. So those are probably the most important things in terms of security when it comes to a, an, any entryway or exterior door. Now, if you have something like a sliding glass door, well, it's glass door, right? Someone can break through that glass door and get into your house. French doors with all the glass panes, again, somebody can break those. There's really no way to get around that. Now, one of the things that you can do, and if you you're live down in the southeast, you know, my eastern headquarters is in Florida, um, if you live down in the southeast, you might be familiar with hurricane film that you can put over windows. Um, they also make security film. It's usually pretty much the same stuff, but uh, costs a little bit more usually if you go for the security film. Um, but if you go for the hurricane film, you're going to get the same benefit. And that's going to make it, if you put that film on any glass that might be in your door, if you're renting a place, for example, and you can't structurally change things like whether there's glass near the door or not, you can put the security or the hurricane film on that glass, and that can really help. Um, I don't know if, if everybody knows this or not, but maybe common knowledge, maybe you know this, but uh, during the uh, Parkland shootings, the uh, shooter, Cruz, uh, actually went into the school, started shooting outside the school, went into the school, went to a second story, and was intending and tried actually to shoot out of the window into the crowd and then potentially at the responding police officers from an elevated window position. But because it's Florida, those windows had the hurricane film and he was not able to shoot through there. It actually stopped the bullets. He left the guns behind, gave up, and went away um, because he wasn't having any effect. So, so this, this hurricane or security film in some cases can also stop bullets, which is kind of an extra bonus if you have a lot of glass around your house and someone's trying to attack you from inside or while you're inside from the outside. So the film can work on the glass. Um, obviously they make a lot of specialty types of locks that um, block the sliding door from sliding or connect the two pieces, the aluminum in the middle. Now if you have a fiberglass door or like a plastic type door frame around the glass, which I see more and more on like a nylon kind of uh, based material, if you have that plastic there, those old school locks that would connect the two pieces of steel or aluminum that held the two 
door, uh, two window pieces together, those would work really well. If it's just plastic, um, or even if it's wood, that might be more prone to breaking if someone were trying to pry those open because the, the locks are, are kind of notoriously weak on sliding glass doors. So anything that blocks that from moving and then a, a reinforced film on that glass is, uh, is really gonna help. Um, but again, those can be a security weak point as can the French doors. So solid doors around the exterior are the best way to go. Let's see what else we got here. We made a bunch of other questions. Um, we have Alex. Should you try to train your spouse, such as your wife or girlfriend, uh, to shoot for self-defense or home protection, or should you sign her up for a class taught by a respectable instructor? Okay, so I don't even teach my wives, right? So any, <laughs> so you, this, this isn't something that, that um, makes any sense. So the dynamic, I always say like to our instructors, we certify instructors, you, know, you can take a, take a woman to a range, you're dating, you meet a girl, you want to take her out to the range, maybe just familiarization, get someone that you're getting into a relationship with, you meet out to the range, that can be fun, you can have a great time if you're a gun person, whether they are or not, as a way to introduce them to it. But like once you're six months in and like, you know, the, the woman, this goes for women who are instructors too, once like they know you don't pick up your socks in the morning or like whatever it is you have as a, as a less than awesome habit around the house, like they have that and that's in their brain. You're, you cease to be the firearms expert, right? I'm the executive director of Personal Defense Network, but I'm not the guy to teach my wife or girlfriend at whatever given time it is how to shoot a gun. So I actually, uh, in my most recent marriage, we take my, took my wife to several different instructors. Uh, Mike Lowe worked with her. Um, who else worked with her? I think Jeff uh, worked Jeff, Jeff worked with her. He was in was he's in Wisconsin. But he was we were in Houston for some reason. He worked with her down there. We had some of our, our combat focus shooting instructors work with her on a variety of different skills, including um, rifle work. So when it comes to home defense, once you're in a barricaded position, I'm sure we're going to get more into the firearms here as the show goes on. Um, in a barricaded position, having a rifle, the ability to use it, whether it has a laser or a red dot, uh, maybe a suppressed rifle, uh, being barricaded behind an interior door that's, that's reinforced, it, that long gun's great, but moving around the house, um, having the gun inside of a holster, the handgun inside of a holster, or getting an, even your concealed carry permit, if you're, your spouse may not be inclined to carry a gun um, all the time, but, but uh, my wife had got went through, she got her permit at Bristlecone here in uh, Colorado. She went through a class, again, from one of the certified instructors that my company, like, you know, blessed and said, yes, you're awesome, go teach, but it wasn't me. So I'm not a big fan of any of us, even, again, inside of our program, uh, teaching our own spouses or even teaching our kids necessarily. Like, there's too much personal interaction there. You know, these are life and death skills. It's incredibly important that we're able to have a, not, not professional in, in some, you know, obtuse metaphorical sense, but really ha be able to tell somebody when they're doing something right, be able to tell them what they're doing wrong, be able to know that they're going to listen to us as a firearms instructor and not as the brother, sister, husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, whatever all those dynamics are. So I think it's, it is important to take them to a respectable instructor um, that you uh, would train with, right? That, that absolutely somebody you would train with. I don't think you need to send a woman to a woman. There are women's classes that's more marketing than anything else um, when it comes to home defense, especially the, the idea that women may be more comfortable training in a group of women or learning from a female instructor, but there really shouldn't be any different substance. We have a lot of videos, obviously, at PDN, um, taught by women or aimed at women, but the content at the end of the day, like the human grip on a gun is a human grip on a gun. The size of your hand, male or female, is going to dictate some of what gun is going to fit you better, uh, but the idea that you're going to send a, a spouse just to someone you wouldn't train with, you know, if you're a woman, send him to a guy, if you're a guy, send her to a woman, don't worry about any of that, but definitely send them out. Um, one thing I will say too is important is don't assume, I don't think it's a fair assumption that just because you are into PDN Live and you have your concealed carry permit and you take two classes a year and you practice all the time and you're into guns, that your significant other is going to also be into guns. Uh, there are a lot of different ways that someone can be safe in the home, uh, use the locks, use the alarms, understand how to barricade. Maybe, maybe they'll have a taser stage instead of a handgun if they're not into handguns. But if you're going to put guns in the house, you know, one of the, one of the problems I see sometimes is um, a woman will tell me, well, Oh, I don't need to train. I'm not into all the guns. My husband's into it, so I really feel safe and protected. Well, that's great, except for when he's at work or when he's out hunting or when he's out with his buddies or whatever it is he does, right? It's assuming there are moments when the significant other is home without you as the gun person, 
they need to not think just because there's a gun in a box over there somewhere that they should just grab the gun and use it, right? Let's not even uh, consider that appropriate. I would think as a gun owner, it's inappropriate for me to take someone who has no training and, and no awareness and no, you know, context of the scenario, kind of all that, to just say, hey, there's a gun in the box if you need it. I don't even know what that means to them. It's our responsibility to make sure everyone who has access to our firearms, uh, even and especially maybe the people we care about, uh, that they also have the training and the mindset to go with the use, or we accept that they don't, and then we put other pr projects into play, or we put other tactics into play, we put other procedures into play for their safety and their security. Uh, let's see. So, um, someone said, if you have a comment on some defensive measures that are cheap and easy, um, motion sensing lights outside, or fake motion following cameras. I, you know, it, it, the stuff's so cheap at this point, like you can get exterior cameras, um, you can take interior cameras and just like put them in windows. Um, some of the stuff from Motorola, uh, the Hubble camera series comes to mind. Uh, the cameras that we sell at, at Personal Defense Network, if you go into the store here at Personal Defense Network, I have a couple of those set up at the house. Some of these cameras are so inexpensive now, they tie into your Wi-Fi. Um, if your Wi-Fi in your house is secure, then the video stream is secure. It's not like the old baby monitors where you know you just drove around and, and tuned a baby monitor. You got it Sears and Roebuck or something, and uh, you know you were able to listen to people's conversations. The, the video cameras that are tied into your Wi-Fi now are so inexpensive that I don't know if we need to go all the way to fake uh, cameras. But let's talk about it for a minute. We really want to go kind of as cheap as we possibly can for as much coverage. I think motion sensing lights are great. So when we talk about SEPTED, this crime prevention through environmental design, I brought that up already once. If we look at that as, as an issue, uh, lighting is really important, right? Like, let me see if we have, I know we have, we did a whole DVD on crime prevention through environmental design. Let's see what happens when we put that into the, uh, the search engine there. Boom, what do we get? Uh, crime prevention through environmental design. So there's a downloadable DVD that you can get, and then there's also um, this video, which is kind of an overview of, of the physical design, the whole like what you do around your house, controlling access, the lighting scheme that you put up there, making sure people again see that de you have a deadbolt, see that you have security doors, see that you you care about your home, and making sure that like for example, if you have trees, that you trim them up so that no one can hide you know, behind that tree next to your house and try to get into the window. If you have shrubberies, that you trim them down so that nobody can be hiding behind them and that you have a clear line of sight, you know, into your window. If you don't want people looking in your windows, then great, get shades. But outside your house, if you put up tall fences or you have trees that are overgrown or hedges that are overgrown, first of all, if they're overgrown and they look sloppy, again, that sends the message to the potential thief, oh, this person isn't paying attention to their property. I wonder if I can break in there. On the other hand, if it's all well manicured and set up properly, not only does it send the message, oh, this person really cares about their stuff, it also sends the message that there's no way for me to get that in through that window, that ground floor window, without somebody being potentially able to see me, if it's a nosy neighbor or if it's somebody walking by or just somebody driving by. Um, and then that motion sensing light, when you get close to the house, boom, that light comes on. That's really important too. In fact, I've got uh, a situation here where there's a there's an area, there's an issue of code and of our you know, kind of HOA circumstances here at the Western HQ that I wasn't super happy about uh, because of a certain blind spot area around the house. And I put a cheap motion sensor light out there. So there's a motion sensor light that works off of batteries and it's on a schedule to change the battery. And it, it glows blue, first of all, the little sensor, so it's kind of like a night light in that sense, and that people see something if they happen to try to get into that blind spot around the house. And if they come within a certain you know, number of feet of it or a couple number of yards of it, then the light comes on. And, and that motion sensing light, to me, is an interactive warning. Even if somebody says, oh, it's just a motion sensing light, again, the fact that I bothered to put it there hopefully sends a signal to them that we're paying attention to what goes on around the house. And in that particular space, if we needed to be around that part of our perimeter at night, it also provides home safety. Because again, lighting is a safety issue, so I'm not stumbling around in the dark. Now, it doesn't matter, I carry a flashlight around all the time, but you know, maybe one of the stepkids is out there, or my wife's out there, and they don't have a flashlight with them. Boom, motion sensing light comes on. Um, it's a great, cheap, easy way to deal with uh, crime prevention issues and um, again, it gives you a practical safety um, aspect as well. So we can go home there. I was trying to figure out how to use this thing well. Um, what else do we have? So that's that's probably the cheapest easy way. The other thing is 
door jams, and I think all of my door jams are upstairs. There's a sliding barn door here on the uh, studio room, so the Wedget um, door jam, I don't think I actually have one staged down here, but Wedgets are super cheap. Just like, well, you know what, watch this. I don't know. I think we have a video on that, too. Let's see if we have the Wedget. I love this little, I mean, this little thing here. Let's see what happens. Oh, the ultimate door stop. Uh, mm, no, I need to do a video on wedgets, but here we go. Little, go to Walmart and get yourself a wedget. Uh, most of the ones I have are yellow. I bought a batch of yellow for 12 bucks. These are great door stops and they're super cheap. They're a great way for you to barricade um, inside of your home. You can, oh, where'd it go? There it is. So they, you can use these to barricade um, taller doors, thin doors. You can even use it as an evacuation tool. They're like, I carry them in my carry-on luggage. You can grab one, it's got kind of a sharp edge, you can whack somebody with it if you needed to. Um, so the Wedget for 12 bucks is a great way for you to create a barricade space. Again, let's say that you aren't inclined to put a deadbolt on an interior door, or you don't even have a solid door, but you should. You should have a solid door in your barricade area. You should have a, um, what do you call it, you should have a uh, deadbolt on that door, just like you'd have your deadbolt at home. But you don't need that to make a door more secure. And if you're traveling, hotel rooms, whatever, I wouldn't trust that little chain locky thing. Get yourself a wedget, 12 bucks, carry it around. Um, the wedgets are all staged in the two, we have two primary barricade areas, um, one on each of the, the main floor and then the, the upstairs floor. Uh, that you have doors, um, both reinforced, and using that wedget is a way to even further reinforce those doors, plus they can be grabbed and taken to the kids' rooms or one of the bathrooms or you know, wherever else you may be barricading that's an in interior uh, or an inside door. So it's coming into the room. Someone's going to try to break that in. That door frame isn't as strong as it would be if it were an outward opening door with the door behind it, the frame behind it, so you use the wedget. So that's another cheap way to increase the security in your home. And while I'm talking about it, because I know we're going to get there, let me talk about what I'm talking about. When, when I say interior door that's an exterior class door, let's go back to what I was talking about before. The question, I think it was Jim asked the question about um, how do we make an outside door stronger. Well, you should have a one if you, if at least one room in your home that is also set up to be stronger in terms of barricade inside the house, and that would be um, with a fiberglass door, a solid wood door, or one of these class one steel doors. And you can buy those at any of the, you know, Home Depot, Lowe's. You go out and buy these things relatively cheap. If, if someone, and you can go to Craigslist or, you know, the neighborhood swap on uh, your social media. If people are upgrading their house, changing an exterior door, they might have an old exterior door, they got a new one, and they're you know, probably giving them a raise on that. You see a house. How's that? Audio? Audio? Hearing anything now? I don't know. Let's see. What do you think? Let me know if the audio is back. I'm not sure. Technical difficulties.
And we're back. I think. Sounds like we're back. I feel like we're back. And I'll probably get confirmation that we're back because I see the little movie things there. So, sorry about that. Uh, I'm not sure where the audio went out, but I'll kind of go back to recapping that. Yep, we were back. Um, I want to make sure that we have uh, a thorough understanding of what I was talking about. That barricade, that interior barricade. Yeah, we're back. Uh, the interior barricade door being an exterior door that we buy to install inside of that bedroom and that can be relatively cheap. So less than 200 bucks and you should be able to get the exterior door from one of the big box uh, home improvement places as well as the oversized uh, screws and then a cheap deadbolt. That's all you need on that. Uh, let's see. Going back to our questions. Recommendations on suppressors for home use. Um, so let's take a look. I've got a uh, couple of firearms staged over here to talk about. This firearm will, after the show, take it off the uh, tactical walls here, this will go back up into uh, the primary staging area. I'll uh, go ahead and just kind of lock that open and it's clear for sure. Uh, this will go into the primary staging area in the uh, main on the main floor of the house. And this is a uh, 556 AR and it is suppressed, so it's wearing a uh, can from Silencer Co. And I think that the suppressor, if it's relatively easy for you to own the suppressor, so if you already own a suppressor, and the question is, do you want to stage a gun with it, it it's probably a no-brainer that you do. Uh, but it's important to understand that adding the extra length, not as much worried about the extra weight, but the extra length is going to make it harder to move around in a confined space. Now, generally speaking, I don't recommend that you use a rifle as a primary uh, home defense firearm if you're going to be moving around in any space, right? So I think this is a great barricade area tool. Um, and, you know, we've got kids in the house, so for me, if I'm barricaded with this and I need to fire this at someone coming through the doorway inside of my barricade area, um, I know that while I may have auditory exclusion and kind of not be as worried about my hearing, um, if I've got a three-year-old, you know, kind of underfoot or right close to me and that, that echo chamber that happens inside of a relatively small bedroom, that can be, you know, pretty detrimental to her hearing and, you know, the rest of her life. So if I already own the suppressor and it's easy enough to just have that on there and, and mount it and I know that I'm going to be barricaded anyway and not be moving around, then it's kind of a no-brainer. If, if you say to me, well, Rob, should I spend the money, should I jump through the hoops, should I deal with the MFA and get a suppressor for my home defense rifle, I say, you know, do you have the... You know, do you have the, the good red dot sight? Do you have a laser light kind of combo option? Do you have, uh, you know, a reinforced door? Do you have all the other things taken care of that you're going to be able to justify the cost, the effort, uh, the paperwork, all that, the political, you know, going through all the NFA that you have to go through? Is all of that worth it? If you've checked all those other boxes, absolutely it's worth it. But if you don't have a good home alarm system, if you don't have good exterior and interior cameras, if you don't have, you know, a laser light module on your gun, the suppressor is something that I would put, you know, somewhere way under all that stuff. We start talking about home security and home safety. Now, you could go with a shorter setup. So I've got a, a pistol length here. This is instead of a 16-inch gun. Um, this is a pistol length gun with a, a stabilizing brace on the back, which obviously can also touch my shoulder in an emergency situation. And now I've got uh, this can, this is the Chimera from San Francisco, I've got this can on this one, and my overall length is about what it would be if this were a, a rifle length barrel, um, or a carbine length barrel, or you know, an 18 inch barrel or 16 inch barrel with a 2 or 3 inch um, extension on it for a muzzle brake or a flash hider or whatever the device you're going to put on the end. Um, this really isn't much longer than that whole package. So now it's just as easy to move around with this as it would be a 16-inch gun without the suppressor. But again, I've got the red dot sight first. I've got the laser light module first. I've got all those boxes checked before I jump into wanting to put a suppressor on the gun. As far as a handgun goes, uh, let's talk about handguns. So over here I've got um, one of uh, Stackon's new combination uh, quick access safe it's got a quick access access drawer with the big push buttons on top and then it's got the normal like kind of storage safe down there so i've got staging and storage kind of a new thing um definitely a new uh thing from stack on i'm a big fan of staging a defensive gun with a holster or at least with a trigger guard what i don't like the idea of and again i knew we were going to be doing this demo this one's empty what i don't like is the idea that you would insert a magazine, empty magazine, you would insert a magazine, chamber around, 
and just put the gun in the drawer. Right now the problem is I put the gun in the drawer and I hit the buttons. Buttons get hit, it pops open, I reach in, and if I reach in in a panic moment and hit that trigger, that's a problem. I don't want to have a negligent discharge. So if I'm going to have a gun with a trigger exposed, a handgun, then I'm going to not chamber around. So now I can reach in, get my grip, wrap this slide, chambering around, and then proceed to use the gun for defense. The double advantage I get is if I have a holster, I already have the round chambered because now I can't hit the trigger and I can quickly put this holster on, it's a paddle holster, I can put it inside the pants. If you think about waking up in the middle of the night and you're going to have boxers or less on and you can't support the weight of a holster, maybe you're going to have a battle belt, you know, stage next to your quick access area, gun comes out, chamber around, holster it, battle belt on, maybe a trigger guard, so you've got a trigger guard on a lanyard in there, now the battle belt goes on, the gun goes in, the trigger guard keeps you from hitting the trigger, you pull the gun, the trigger guard stays behind, you go right to the holster, because I am a big fan of the staged position. So the idea of staging a gun for personal defense is physically putting it in a place where you're most likely to be or where you're most likely to go in terms of that home invasion, home defense moment. But the staged position of a in terms of a defensive gun that you're wearing, I'm gonna tuck my little lav cord out of the way, is to put your hand on the gun and stage it for presentation. And this is the configuration that I would recommend you move through your house in. You grab your light, you've got your gun staged. You know, why are you moving through your house? You, you shouldn't be moving through your house to look for bad guys, right? Not your job. So again, kind of, this isn't just armed home defense. In fact, I wanted to kind of stay away from the armed home defense tactics. But I want to make sure everybody has a context. You can go look at all the videos we have on armed home defense. You can read the book, defend yourself. You can get all the DVDs. You can do a lot of things around armed home defense. And that's going to be one of the titles that we release at Personal Defense Academy soon, is a distance education class in the concepts of home defense with a gun. But think about this. If I'm wearing a gun and something happens in my house right now, the alarm goes off, baby starts crying, something's happening upstairs. If the alarm went off and I were here alone, right, like swing the barn door closed, like hit the lock and get on the phone, I'll talk about the phone in a minute, get on one of the phones and, and call 911 and get one of these rifles chambered and I'm just going to hang out here, right? But because there's people upstairs that I care about, I'm going to go upstairs. When I go upstairs, I'm not looking for the bad guy, right? I'm moving to them. So I'm going to stage my gun for presentation and move through the house with the light in my hand because what do I know is up there? Well, I absolutely know that my three and a half year old daughter is up there, right? I absolutely know that there are people up there I care about that I want to defend. So as I'm moving up those stairs, I don't want to be leading with the gun, right? Why would I do that? Why would I take the gun and, and lead with the gun when I know I'm moving towards someone I care about? And I get to press the gun. And a lot of people will say to me, well, Rob, come on, you're giving up time, right? Like, what about the time you're giving up? I don't know that I trust myself to be able to draw the gun quickly and defend myself if I need to in this situation, so I want to get the gun out of the holster. I say this to you. If you aren't comfortable, if you aren't confident that you can move through your own home towards your barricade area or towards your kids with the gun in the holster and be confident that you could present the gun quickly to defend yourself or move the gun back into the compressed position to defend yourself in close quarters, then I don't know that I trust you to run around with a loaded gun out of the holster towards your family. Make sense? Like if you're not confident and comfortable enough to be able to draw the gun and defend yourself quickly from the holster when you know you're moving towards good guys and you don't want to lead with the gun, then how can you be comfortable enough with your ability to control the gun while it's out, especially if you're nervous, right? You might be pointing the gun and your finger might be floating towards the trigger, trigger checking. We know it happens even with well-trained people. So that's the issue. So I like a staged defensive pistol. Um, in a holster or a gun that's staged with uh, a holster so you can quickly put that holster on or when you're barricaded and you're in that static position, the long gun. So that was a, a bit of a tangent, but it's a, I think an appropriate tangent once we get to the point where we're actually holding guns in the hand. Well, let's talk about that. I mentioned the phone. Um, one of the things that we talk about with the phone is that if you have a phone like this one here in particular, this is off contract, so it says no service on it. Uh, but if I were to put my clear, my you know passcode in and dial 911, I can still make a 911 call on this phone. So this is actually um, an old family phone that staged. I brought it down. I brought everything. Kind of, let me bring some other things out here too. So I brought things out of our primary staging area that I wanted you to be able to see. Let me 
grab my medical kit. I'm going to grab my light. So one of the things that's in there is one of these classic old Surefire G2 lights. This one goes all the way back to the Valhalla days. We used to, uh, for some of the military guys we had coming through, they were in a, a kind of special assignment um, role, which was funny because at one point one of the units that came through, one of the teams that came through and said, well, I'm only going to ever use the Beretta, you know, the M9. I'm only ever going to use the Beretta, so why should I not run it like this? They were running it in a way I wasn't recommending, but they were basing it off of the Beretta is the only thing they're going to use. They went off, did a combat deployment, came back to another class for this low-profile mission with blocks, and when they came back with the low-profile mission, this is 12 years ago, 15 years ago, um, then the guy kind of had to be like, whoa, whoa, yeah. You know, one of the guys called him out because I don't remember. They're like, hey, remember when dude said he was only going to use a bread of the rest of his life? Look at him now. Well, one of the things they had with the, in this low-profile mission was they weren't being issued handheld lights. So it's kind of weird. They were being sent off with like a Glock 26, an extra magazine, a crack holster, and no lights. So we set him up with a better holster and a bunch of these lights. So I've had one, a bunch of these that were laying around because so we had some left over from that contract. This G2, um, kind of like an indestructible, awesome, durable light, still old-fashioned, incandescent bulb. It's only got, I don't know, some number of lumens. It isn't a million, but it's good enough. You know, I can still distract you if I need to. And more importantly, I can light up a bedroom. So that lives in there. Um, I've got a, a light stick in there. We also have those in case uh, I'm, I need to move and we need a light source somewhere or I want to mark something or light up a room. I've got that. We have a medical kit in there. Um, this is actually a medical kit that if you trained with me in the last year, you've seen uh, this 511 bag out on the range. It now lives in the primary staging area because I'm off the tour season. And this old phone. And this old phone has a charger inside of our quick access area. The charger is wired in through the back of it. Uh, inside the same place the firearms are, and this lives in there, you know, ready to be used for uh, a 911 call. So you should stage an old cell phone as long as it can get, um, it doesn't have to have a contract, as long as it can get cell serp, cell connection, you can make that 911 call, and then the light source. So those are some of the things that we stage in addition to the, um, the guns. So this is, uh, I don't know, a good time for a commercial. So if you go here, um, it says, join the team of PDN instructors, unlimited self-defense training, tips, demonstrations, insight. Um, take it to the range or wherever you do your training. A lot of the information in Personal Defense Network isn't directly related to firearms. So like we're talking about tonight, home security, home safety. Um, there's a lot of medical information out there. There's a lot of um, training concept information. So one of the things we get sometimes is, well, how are you going to teach somebody to shoot through a video? Or how are you going to do distance education in concealed carry? when people aren't on the range. Hey, I get it. Like, I, no, one, no one ever said, I can teach you the concepts, I can teach you the fundamentals, I can help you with your training model, I can give you a lot of gear recommendations, I can help you understand all the concepts and principles that underlie your shooting. But ultimately, if you want to learn how to shoot, you got to get out on the range and shoot. Can't manage recoil, there isn't much recoil with a, with a photon, right, if you're just using a laser trainer or something. So, what are we talking about? Well, just, just on this page, right? Handgun training, rifle training, shotgun training, concealed carry, tactical shooting drills, handgun training, trigger control, concepts, incident analysis, self-defense weapons, unarmed defense, self-defense for women, knife fighting techniques, self-defense skills, home defense, home defense weapons, holsters and usage, less lethal weapons, personal protection devices, tools and accessories, um, work reviews on self-defense products, and then uh, over here, we've also got articles uh, on home defense, personal security. We've got a whole different section just for the Personal Defense Network training tour and a lot of the tour updates, information from our tour sponsors, including Springfield, who is sponsoring tonight's uh, episode of PDN Live, Springfield Armory. Um, I carry a Springfield Armory gun. A lot of people kind of get that reversed. They are sponsors of uh, PDN Live tonight, and they are sponsors of our tour for the last, I think, five or six years because I decided to start carrying this gun instead of the... Uh, chopped Glock 19 that I was carrying, the 26L. So it was a basically a double stack, kind of like this, about a four inch barrel, but a short uh, 10 round chopped 26 length grip. Um, it's more comfortable to carry a single stack. So I, I decided to carry a single stack. When this gun came out, that created the relationship between Springfield, uh, just because I, I loved, loved the gun, and that grew into a great relationship. We're proud to have them as a partner and appreciate them sponsoring tonight's PDN Live event. So like I said, um, choose, your, choose a personal defense category to start your learning. And again, this is free. So um, I'm not even logged in. You can see I'm not logged in with my account. So sometimes you may go there. I don't know. Let's go to rifle training and see what happens. So if we go to rifle training and it says view all rifle training videos, 
Um, sometimes you're going to see, so these are all the, what do we got, M1A and 6.5 Creedmoor. There's a Springfield gun. Not really a home defense gun, by the way, unless you have a really big home, um, but kind of a cool, like, new round in a throwback gun. Um, the POF Revolution Rifle, they were our, our tour sponsors. You just saw me with a couple of uh, Patriot Ordnance Rifles. Sometimes what you're going to see is that these videos will say premium. So we have to scroll down. These are all free videos. And then we get down here, here's a couple premium videos. So here's one about a fit shot exercise, the rifle burpee, back when I used to uh, exercise more than I do now. And uh, live fire and dry fire training, like how to do that safely. That's a premium technique. And then boom, we get back into a couple of... Um, free videos as well. So you can see on this particular page, one, two, three, four, five, whoops, what did I do? Oh boy, I'm going to need to watch that now. But there were about five or six uh, free videos and a couple of premium videos. And that's about what you're going to find is that, that most of the information available, greater than 50% of the information available at PDN as far as the videos and the articles are all free. So you get all the articles, you get articles over at the blog and all the stuff there. A lot of times the blog will be updates, training talk hosted by Grant Cunningham. Um, they are not you. We have a great series from William April. He uh, twice a month gives us uh, kind of real world self defense situations. There's another they are not you. Um, so you can get these updates. Um, there's a road rage incident, thing like that, as you go through the Clearwater Stand Your Ground case. It's an article I wrote um, recently about the situation uh, in the parking lot where the guy was really upset because somebody was in the handicap spot. Um, today on Armed uh, American Radio, I actually did a piece talking about the uh, what Lakeland, Florida, where the uh, commissioner, the guy who owned the uh, pawn shop, uh, shot a guy, you know, really bad looking shooting on video. Um, so we do a lot of that. We do a lot of breakdowns uh, and discussion about real world events, situations that actually happen, and then boom, that's the blog. Then you come back here and you go through the training. So take a look at personaldefensenetwork.com, follow us on the Facebook, all that stuff, Instagram, and uh, you get to learn a lot. Let's see what we got. More questions. Trinity asked, how do I get my wife to stop with the attitude of, it won't happen to me? Uh, well, here's how you get your wife to stop doing that. Hey, wife, stop doing that. I get divorced a lot. That's probably not going to work. Uh, let's do this. If you look at, I think I have a book over here. I've got book somewhere. Maybe not. I keep giving copies of this book away. This book, um, can I do it without a glare there? Lessons from the Unarmed America. I just mentioned I did the radio show with Mark Walters today. I, I co-wrote this book with Mark Walters. It to me, I think it's the best kind of one-stop shop piece of information that I've produced that is for people who are on the fence or maybe in a little bit of denial about whether or not they need to take responsibility for their safety and for the safety of those they love and people around them. Um, that particular book, what happens is Mark did, went out and did the research, got the stories of people, and, and are not all gun things, by the way. In fact, some of them I even go to point out how a gun would have been irrelevant in the situation and the gun wasn't the answer. But Mark will go out and talk about people who've um, suffered from attacks, people who have been attacked when they weren't armed in the sense of being ready. Not just having a gun, although it is a very gun-centric book, um, not just having a gun, but maybe not having the knowledge. You know, as I always say, arm, being armed isn't a physical state. It's a mind, mindset, right? Like it's a mental condition, not a physical condition. So if you're prepared, armed with knowledge, armed with a plan, a, a preparation for what could happen, you're not in denial, that's a, a big thing. So when you talk about home defense, home security, of course, a lot of people don't even set their alarm. So you've got the alarm, you've got the cameras, you've got the lights, you don't change the batteries, you don't arm the system, you don't check the camera, you get the alert motion on your front porch, you just assume it's the wind or a raccoon or something, you don't really look at it. That's the complacency, that's the denial, it can't happen to me. So that book goes through these stories, Mark interviews the people, tells what actually happened, then I come in and I say, okay, here's the problem they faced. Here's the mistake that they made, I and mean, it might be they didn't have a gun stage, they didn't practice, but sometimes it's something completely different, having to do with medical or, you know, parking in the wrong place or not having a friend, you know, walk you through the dangerous part of town that you couldn't avoid or whatever it was. And then I talk about what you could do to make it less likely that you could be a victim in the same way. So whether that's a change in behavior or a change in your gear or a change in your training or a change in your tactics, um, that's what that's all about is, uh, you know, kind of here's real stories, things that actually happened. And here's the stories from the people themselves sharing the information with Mark. He's a great writer. He shares those stories really well in an interesting, compelling way. So it's not like a, reading a police report about it. And then it comes on to me to say, okay, here's the problem. 
and it's real. And this is the mistake this person made, or this is the lack of preparation that they showed. And here's how you personally can overcome that. And it's not all about the gun. Um, a lot of it is, as, as you allude to, about accepting that it could happen in your town. I live in a, uh, you know, the, the Western headquarters here is, is a, in a relatively upscale part of town, a very kind of, you know, it doesn't happen here kind of town, but it happens here. I had a really good friend. Um, I, someday you may see a friend of mine on video here, if he's watching this tonight, he's uh, laughing right now out of fear maybe. You may see, um, you know, I talk about some of the mistakes I've made in the past, he showed me a video of him kind of getting caught up in the emotion and you see, you know, they had an attempted robbery, they got the alert, they saw the camera and, you know, sure enough, you know, the guy goes driving away down the alley and next thing you do is you see him come running into the screen and he didn't chase the guy down, he didn't shoot at him, he didn't do anything completely over the top, but even having gone outside at that point, you know, let the guy get a few blocks away, call the police, then they, they can come see if there was damage or whatever else, um, not getting caught up in that stuff. Well. The it can't happen to me attitude is, I think, what leads to a lot of the emotional reaction, sometimes a very dangerous overreaction that exposes you to more fear. So Trinity, I would share that for sure. Just the idea that um, if you're not prepared or you think it can't happen to you, when it does happen or if it does happen, your response is going to be even worse, right? So if you guys are even bothering to have the conversation, how about just do the what if game? You know, what if that happened. And one of the stories that's shared in there is about uh, a kid that starts choking on food. And, you know, we all talk about the Heimlich maneuver or CPR or all these little kind of fundamental basic safety issues in our lives. And we've seen the signs on the wall, but maybe a lot of us haven't actually physically practiced it or thought about it. And when your kid starts choking, right, and you don't really know what to do. And my, you know, uh, baby, the three-year-old, just the other day, she you know, bacon, a little bit undercooked at a restaurant, and she puts the whole thing in her mouth and starts chewing, tries to swallow half-chewed, you know, not crispy bacon. Personally, I don't know why you wouldn't have crispy bacon, but they didn't have crispy bacon at the restaurant. She starts choking, and I had to go in there and sort of pull the whole thing out. Um, that's, in that moment, people, some people freeze, right? Now, you know, having to pull something out of when someone's choking is something that, you know, I've thought about, or, you know, sweeping the airway, kind of all the clearing the tongue for CPR or for choking or whatever it is. So it, I visualized that, but I actually had to put it into play. If I'd have never really taken any of that seriously, who knows what I would have done in that moment. You know, ISIS shows up. I've been practicing that. I've been talking about it on video, but baby choking on bacon, hadn't really practiced that explicitly, hadn't run through that scenario, but conceptually, you know, luckily responded the right way. So again, armed, being armed with knowledge. Um, we got about 10 minutes left. Let me get a few more um, questions. Uh, any gun safe recommendations? Okay, and then somebody says, what's the um, best basic handgun for home defense? So if you carry a gun outside of the home, like that gun is the one that you're most familiar with, the one that you're used to, the one that hopefully you know fits your hand and your practice with it, that should be your home defense gun. I don't, I don't think, you know, I already talked about why I like handguns as the primary go-to because they're more maneuverable and you can you know go to your kids or go to your barricade area but you know this gun becomes the default home defense gun because I'm wearing it when I take this off the guns that I have staged like the 5 inch um, XD uh, mod 2 is the corollary to this It's the full size full length version full grip full capacity version of this same gun so trigger is similar the grip sim similar it's a double stack versus a single stack if I were to carry, let's say you carry a, a you know, Glock 19, well maybe the Glock 17 or the Glock 34 is the gun that you choose to have staged at home. Um, if you carry the, the XD, uh, the, the 3.3 the 3 inch XDS, maybe you, know, you have a, a 4 inch XDS in the quick access safe and that's the one you can seal during winter, but you're carrying the 3.3 inch XDS so you have single stack, single stack. Uh, the 4 inch XD Mod 2 versus the 5 inch XD Mod 2. A lot of people will use a larger gun. If you're going to start getting into different guns, I think is if you stay in sort of the same category, it's not horrible. But you know, if, if you have a, a Glock in one room, an M and P in another room, and a, a XD that you carry, you have three different flavors of the same thing, right? Don't put your finger on the trigger; it's not going to go bang. Put your finger on the trigger and press the trigger; it's going to go bang without any manual safety levers or decockers or any of that, um, provided you brought you, you bought the appropriate M and P, uh, not the one with the safety lever. You don't need the safety lever on that gun. Um, same thing, you throw the HK um, VP9 in there, you can throw the SIG 320 again without the safety in there. You could have that gun collection and not be too far out of bounds. It's when you when somebody tells me, you know, hey, I carry a, 
an XD 4 inch. I've got an XD 5 inch staged in uh, one room in the house, but we're going to get another quick access safe. And I'm going to, I was thinking about getting a, a, the new uh, SIG or the new HK or the, the Steyr or M series or whatever. It's like, why not just get another XD, right? If that's the gun you rely on, if that's the gun you, you shot a lot, if you have the 4 inch version and the 5 inch version, get another 5 inch version, get another 4 inch version. Right? The magazines all work the same, the, the sight channels are the same, like everything's the same, the holsters all work together interchangeably. Just keep doing that. Your gun collection should be stored somewhere, not staged, right? You, you know, a revolver here, 1911 there, Beretta here, Glock there, XD over here, that doesn't make any sense, right? Like, consistency is incredibly important. Um, so, people, somebody asked about the, the best home safe, so Gun Vault is a, a company that I've used for a long time. Um, for quick access safes, um, again, this this stuff. And you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna see if I can do. I can do this. I can do what I want. It's my studio. Um, check that out. So that's the new. I'm gonna get that. I don't know what this is. This old calendar. Get that out of the way. So um, there's the rifle that I just used. But this this safe, like I said, we have the quick access safe. There's big buttons up here. I don't even have to be looking. And kind of come in here, and boom, that pops open. That's the staging area, and then this has a storage area. And I heard that Stackon was really up in their game under Alpha Guardian's uh, new ownership and leadership for them. And uh, that safe is a perfect example of that. So that's kind of a new prototype. I think it was like the fourth one that they ever released. And uh, I was lucky enough to get a chance to bring it here into the studio as my, my go-to studio um, staging area and storage area. Um, sitting up on top of it, this is one that a lot of people have seen in, in home defense classes, armed home defense classes on the tour the last couple years. This is a uh, you know, really heavy um, box. This one is uh, the same people that make Truck Vault make this one. Um, so this is pretty cool with big mechanical buttons. Um, not as cool, I think, as like a, a good biometric or the big heavy push buttons, but these mechanical buttons are, are cool and good to go. That has held up to a lot of students um, using it in a lot of rough ways that were unpracticed with it. Um, over the, the last, uh, that one, two years I've had that, actually two tours that one's been on, so you've probably seen that one in videos. Um, I use Canon safes for the primarily for the big safes historically. I've got one of those at the Eastern Headquarters. I've got another one of those um, at my dad's place where we have some family firearms that are still in his name staged there. And um, then I'm a big fan of the vault room. You know, if you have enough guns, you eventually get to the point where a reinforced door with a deadbolt lock, um, that's a, an extra room, um, you know, in, in a basement especially, if you can get two of the walls sort of set up as exterior cinder block into the dirt walls and then reinforce the uh, the doorway with again with a barricade style exterior door that vault room can be you know a little bit of a workspace but really the storage area um, once you get to the point where you have too many guns for you know one of the large safes if you have the extra space in your home reinforcing that room um, could even be cheaper than some of the big you know 50 and 60 gun safes that you can get um, but quick access safes you know the gun vault is absolutely my long time historic go-to there's some other companies out there, um, somewhere around here I had, um, there it is, the uh, Identilock, you know, this isn't even a safe, but if you're traveling, I mean, how much easier does it get than something like this, um, and then this reads um, off of the biometric, this reads, my fingerprint pops open, and that clamshells around the trigger guard, so I can close that around there, I can load, unload the gun, this just lives underneath the gun, and then, you know, relatively quickly, assuming that it's reset, I can touch that, and get that to pop open. So it's kind of mad at me right now because there's not actually a gun in there and I closed it when I wasn't supposed to. So I'll let that reset for a second. But when you set it up properly, that, that uh, Identilock works really well as far as the fingerprint reading. And it does it kind of universally all the way around when you don't use it wrong and it gets mad at you. Um, the mechanical locks are great. The battery operated locks are great. Um, there's a lot of different companies out there that are that are cool, and you can get a lot of that information here at PDN as well. Um, but Canon Safe and Gun Vault have been my longest go-tos uh, for the longest time. Let's see. Um, my wife and I have a house full of kids. Creates extra extra issues concerning uh, securing firearms and crossfire concerns. Have you come across any blazingly awesome tips? in regard to these. Well, I already gave you my biggest number one tip is remember you're not looking for the bad guy. Your job is not to go looking for the bad guy in your house. Your job might be to go looking for family members or to get your family members to the barricade area. So the number one rule, you've got people you care about in the house, don't lead with the gun. You shouldn't be running around with the gun out um, if you don't need to be. The long gun's harder to move around with than a pistol, a holstered pistol with your hand on it. That's the best way to move around. As far as crossfire goes, you know, first of all, again, you, you 
sort of want to set it up so that if, if there's an uh, imminent home invasion that you're able to, to get your family together or that there's a, a system for getting the family into one place. If something happens, you know, immediately and you fall asleep on the couch, you know, watching the, the footballing or whatever, and then some guy kicks the door open and like, oh man, I got to defend myself, you're wearing a gun. Or you wake up in the middle of the night and you hear the kids screaming, alarms going off, dogs barking, glass breaks, whatever it is. You grab your holstered pistol, you put it on, you have your light, you go to check on the kids, and there's a guy in the hallway, in the next room, whatever it is. You want to start thinking about that defensive shot, and you, know, you, you don't shoot hoping to get a hit. You should shoot expecting to get a hit, and therefore um, not really be worried about, you know, if you're choosing the right ammo and you, you're doing what you're supposed to do for balance and speed and precision. Our primary concern is hitting the bad guy with the right bullet and then the expectation that we're going to affect the bad guy negatively and the bullet's going to stay in the body or not have a lot of energy when it comes out. So we're not as worried about those over-penetration things. Here's the best advice I can give you. Best advice I can give you as far as um, kids go and, and barricade areas, if you can't get to the kids, um, one of the best things you can do, and again, I'm going to go ahead and just kind of manually pan over here and take a look, bookshelves, right? If you've got bookshelves, books are going to stop. Um, now, these bookshelves have a bunch of gaps in them, things like that. But if I were setting that up in a kid's room, you know, one of the advantages of books in a kid's room is that they might read books, which is great. Um, but in addition to reading the books, those books, if you have a densely packed um, bookshelf inside the kid's room, that makes a great bullet stop, right? So in other words, that bullet is very unlikely to go through the wall. Appropriate defensive bullets, is very, they're very unlikely to go through a wall and through the books on that other bookshelf, even if you are using a rifle. Um, now the kids know if they, you don't get to them, if they get woken up at night, they can hunker down in front of that bookshelf or at least set the bookshelf up in their room so that if you were to shoot towards that shared wall or towards the wall from the hallway, that their bed is, is protected from the most likely trajectories by the bookshelf. Um, that's kind of the best advice I can give you as far as, as, far as crossfire or overpenetration concerns go. Um, let's see. I'm going to look at um, stage a gun with a holster. We talked about that. It's now 8.02. Feelings for shotguns for urban defense. Cop told you you were a fool if you didn't have one. I'm going to guess that's an old cop or that's old advice. Um, most law enforcement has moved away from shotguns. When I went through the academy, the, the academies, when I went through all my fundamental training in the 90s, the shotgun was the go-to. Um, in the late 90s and early 2000s, I was helping a lot of agencies and I fought the fight at my agency to move from shotguns to rifles. We kind of busted through all the myths of overpenetration. Um, if you become a premium member at Personal Defense Network, one of the, the videos you get online for free is this two-hour um, intermediate barriers and, and penetration demonstrations. We, we show what happens with drywall, and it's not just a bunch of stacked sheets of drywall. It's, you know, drywall, room distance, another set of drywall, actual, you know, the four-inch gap, the whole thing, and then hallway distance, and then another set of drywalls. We should have show you what would happen if you were to shoot across the cross-section of multiple rooms and hallway between them, and what happens as far as deflection and all that. The lightweight, fast-moving, cylindrical-type bullets that come out of the 5.56 round um, are probably uh, significantly less likely to hurt someone else on the other side of those walls from the room you're shooting in in a traditional Western uh, construction home uh, than a, a 9mm bullet. You know, if you're using 124 grain or 147 grain 9mm that looks like a ball, right? And, and even if it's a hollow point bullet, it still, if it tumbles, still retains pretty much the same shape as it goes through the wall. It's got more mass, right? 124 grains or 147 grains versus 55 grains for a typical 5.56 bullet. Um, that mo mass means more momentum. It's going to carry its velocity um, and it's going to follow the same path more likely, which is the path of a human torso. If you were shooting at a human torso through that wall, um, so that was back in the days when everybody assumed that a rifle for home defense meant like a 30-30 hunting round or something, uh, or they had the myth in their head of the old 308s or 30-06, you know, kind of military ball ammo that was going to go, you know, through three homes in the suburbs. That's not what we're talking about. Proper defensive ammo, especially in the 556 um, caliber, shot out of appropriate guns, is less likely to hurt someone on the other side of the wall. So. If we take that out of the equation, uh -oh. if we take that out of the equation, then what we're going to have is the uh, reality of a need. That was my alarm saying it's time to be done. Uh, then what we have is the reality of 
that equation that says, oh, rifles can hurt people, but long guns are better for defense equals you must have a shotgun, that's just antiquated advice. I might have no problem with a shotgun for home defense, but I don't have a shotgun staged here. I do have a shotgun staged down at the Eastern headquarters, and it's a 20 gauge. Um, so if you're going to go to a shotgun, I'm a big fan of the 20 gauge. And I'll be talking more about that uh, on a Personal Defense Network video coming up because I'm going to be doing some work with a uh, new shotgun, or actually an older shotgun that I got um, reworked um, by Vang Comp. Uh, Vang did some great work on there, and that was set up uh, by John Johnson over at Ballistic Radio. He hooked that connection up, and they reworked a gun for me. So you're going to see that on an upcoming Personal Defense Network video, although I am primarily a fan of rifles for home defense and not the uh, shotgun. So... With that, I will wrap it up uh, when, and tell you that you can always learn uh, a lot more about all this stuff at personaldefensenetwork.com. You can follow me on the social media, um, Instagram, you can follow me on the Twitter, you can follow me at Facebook, uh, the personal uh, page uh, kind of puts out everything, including pictures of the baby, and um, I've got my uh, Cryptech standing by for a big archery hunt next week, uh, going out actually with the PDN leadership team, we're going to go do a little retreat. I'll be wearing Cryptek, hopefully posting some deer pictures to the Instagram uh, and the uh, Facebook. But Rob Pink is Pro, Facebook.com, Rob Pink is Pro is kind of the training, the political information. If you are interested in the politics, uh, we don't talk a lot about that at Personal Defense Network. But check out the position statements at gunrights.info um, from Second Amendment Organization. A uh, lot of good talk over there and on my professional page about the gun politics. Big election coming up, midterm elections, um, more important than a lot of people think. Um, really pay attention to what your potential candidates are saying about uh, your rights, your rights to personal defense. Um, that's kind of get off the politics there, but I do like to make sure we remind people if you care about this stuff, you have to care about the rights that you want, the you want to be able to exercise responsibly in terms of defending yourself and your family with a firearm when appropriate. Uh, PersonalDefenseNetwork.com, close the box, get the free value. If you're still there after a couple of weeks, that's when you sign up for the free newsletter and think about the premium gold or new platinum level memberships. Thanks again to Springfield Armory for uh, sponsoring tonight. And uh, with that, I'm out of here. We'll see you on social media, and we'll see you next month for Personal Events Network Live. Again, in the meantime, Training Talk with Grant Cunningham will be available twice before you see me again from uh, the Western HQ studio.